put against the wells, and I'm going to show a cross section right through the middle of the site to explain a little bit of the hydrogeology. One of the ways in which it's different is it's much closer to land surface, whereas the Benicci site was about six to ten meters below the land surface. This site is only about three meters below land surface. Also, this is the, so the, the buried tank would have been about right here, two meters below the land surface. And then there, there's a perched water table, which also complicates the, the hydrologic system. This is the semi-confining layer here, which is sand with some dense stringers of clay. And this is the regional water table here. During this study, this entire zone was saturated, and this was probably from this is from 90 to 90, early 93, and uh, it was totally saturated, probably because of high rainfall and, and uh, during this time of the study. This is what you see if you look at if you map just the benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and the thionines that are in the perched water in milligrams per liter. This is where the gasoline was located in the perched water. Only gasoline is a free product, was only really found in the perched water, not in the water table aquifer. And you can see that, that in the perched water, this is the contour for greater than two milligrams per liter of these, these six compounds. And you can see there's no preferred direction of flow here. And it's just kind of sitting there in this perched water zone. I'm going to show a cross section a little bit later, A to A prime, right through the middle of this zone. But in the water table aquifer, which is only about two meters deeper in the system, you can see that it was quite different. Not only was the distribution quite different than what we saw before, but it varied seasonally. And this is where the gasoline uh, was found in the perched water, but the, as I said, this was not found in the water table aquifer. This is just for scale, so you can remember what the perched water looked like. And you can see that there was a zone of very high concentration up in this part of the form, even off the map. And the, this is the preferred, this is the general direction of groundwater flow. And you can see there is some movement in that direction. But in July of 90, as opposed to January of 90, you can see that the, the system had changed considerably. But this is the main direction of flow. This has seemingly disappeared. And I think this is probably due to several things. One is that the gradient is very low, and this is a very shallow system, so it doesn't take much change to uh, change the geochemistry of the system and the movement of hydrocarbons in the system. Furthermore, there's probably a conduit for the hydrocarbons to get into the water table aquifer from a well that went through the, in the first zone. Also, there are irrigation wells that probably also affect uh, the flow of water here. So this is a more complicated system than the one I had showed you before. This is that cross section through the middle of the flume, and again, it shows dissolved oxygen concentrations to show that in the first water zone, there has been an anoxic zone developed, much like we had seen in Bemidji. But this is not developed very well in the water table aquifer. This is a very uh, ephemeral zone where things change very rapidly. And I'm going to show some data, which will be right, right along this um, area right here. The first two sampling points will be in the perched water zone. This one is in the middle, in between the perched and the water table. And this, these two will be in the water table aquifer. And this shows the concentrations here of organic, organic acids and hydrocarbons on two different scales of milligrams per liter. And as I said, these two are in the first water zone, and this is in the middle. Of it. This is the water table. So this whole section here is of only about four meters in depth. So you can see tremendous differences here at only four meters. Now the hydrocarbons here are the same ones we were talking about before. These are the total benzene and alkyl benzene. Uh, the organic acids here are aliphatic and aromatic acids, which are formed as products from degradation products, uh, degraded reactions involving the hydrocarbons. And you can see that there's a good correlation here of these organic acids and hydrocarbons. If you look at what uh, electron receptors are available, again, you see another depleted. You see big differences between the first zone and the water table aquifer. For example, oxygen is totally depleted here. Sulfate and nitrate has been reduced for and the underlying water table aquifer, although they have been reduced somewhat, they still are, are abundant. Okay, you can see that see that the products that are formed again are, are what you might expect. The fact that you would have uh, uh, in the first water zone where you have depletion of these electron acceptors, you do find a fair amount of ammonia and you find uh, some H2S, you find a lot of iron. Now iron is on a scale here the bottom, which is 10 times the scale of the top, so the iron is at 40 milligrams per liter, uh, about 40 milligrams per liter out here. And so, you, and, but you, the difference between this site and the other site is you don't have any methane being formed, and I think that's probably.
probably because we have plenty of nitrate sulfate and iron coatings that the reaction sequence hasn't gotten as far as forming methane in this particular site. This is just a sampling uh, showing here how we're, we collect some of our samples for unstable constituents. And the water is coming here through the peristaltic pump through a filter. And then we have a little sampling valve here so we can evacuate the entire system and get, uh, remove all the, the water that might have been exposed to oxygen. And then flip the valve and collect the water. And this is sampling here for sulfide where we have chemicals here. This is a modified methyl and blue technique where we can collect in the syringe and measure for sulfide concentrations. We also do iron and methane in very similar ways. We do iron colorimetrically in the field using by pyridine technique. Methane we collect in the end syringes, which we then uh, put the water sample in a you know, serum bottle and then analyze the headspace back in the lab by gas from the charger. Is the next slide ready yet? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, to summarize the, what we found from these two slides, uh, this is oxidizing groundwater on this side, and this is the Bemidji site, and this is the Galloway site, and uh, this is uncontaminated groundwater, which is it's not even not coming in contact with free products. And you can see that this is the concentration here of total inorganic carbon, which includes not only carbonate, but carbonic acid, aqueous CO2. And uh, you can see that the total uh, inorganic and organic carbon concentrations here increase significantly from moving from this oxidized uh, background water to reducing groundwater, which is very contaminated. And this shows you the approximate range of magnitude of change here. Both energy, total inorganic carbon and total organic carbon. You can also see what electron acceptors are available at this site. There was little nitrate or sulfate, but a fair amount of oxygen. Of course, we had iron and manganese coatings on mineral grain. Whereas at this site, we had uh, some nitrate, sulfate present, and of course, some oxygen present, which was both sites was depleted uh, very, very early. And at, for, if you look at the products that, that, that are formed, you can see that you have methane formed uh, at the Bemidji site, and we do not have methane formed at the Galloway site. And you can see that we did pick up traces of ammonia and sulfide and, and manganese here. Here, we had no sulfide detected. We had a little, traces of ammonia, a little bit of manganese, but what was common to both were these very high concentrations of iron. So we thought that one thing we could do is, is because you have these environments where you have very high iron concentrations as well as high inorganic carbon concentrations, we could look for autogenic mineral formation. <coughs> the next slide shows what an iron coating, this is what this is a secondary precipitate. This is an iron coating on a mineral drain, which is the substrate that's available. Uh, to be reduced, and this was taken at the Bemidji site. <coughs> if you look at this on an EHPH diagram, uh, for the first site I talked about, the Bemidji site, the pH should, is about uh, 6.8 6 uh, 6 in the contaminated uh, plume. It was 7.5 <coughs> in the contaminated water, but the reducing contaminated water is about 6.8, and so it's plot right here, the siderite pH <coughs> stability, so you would expect the siderite might be precipitated. Also, if you uh, look at the results from the Galloway site, the pH there was uh, about, initially was 4.7, and it was about 6, uh, pH of about 6 in the most contaminated area. So it falls right in the zone here between uh, hydrate, siderite, and ferrous iron zone. Also did some geochemical modeling, and by looking at these in Watek, you can predict that, that siderite and pyrite both should be precipitating. So the result of the first site, uh, the Midgey site, uh, we found what we think is autogenic siderite form. And this is in a cavity of a calcite uh, grain. And you can see that the distance across here was about one micron across the distance. These are little nodules that were formed in here. Um, we are, pretty, are quite sure this is siderite. It has never been reported in these shallow aquifer systems, but has been reported in some marine systems. And, and, and deeper systems, but siderite is fairly difficult to find in shallow environments. And if you look at the energy dispersive X-ray analysis of those, of those nodules, you can see that it is mostly iron. However, we also found the same nodules where we also found iron and calcium together, and we think that we also probably have a fair with calcite forming. And the literature shows that you can substitute up to about 23% calcium in, in siderite. So we think we have not only siderite, but a fair calcite forming. And this, this was found fairly abundantly 
in the sun. We also found a uh, crystal of magnetite, and this is a distance of about one and a half microns. Now, magnetite has been reported to be associated with iron uh, reduction by tubers, by Ludwig and others of the survey, and by Bell and Mills at the University of Virginia. And it has also been associated with petroleum deposits. But again, to my knowledge, it's not been reported in shallow aquifers. This is really a nice, nice crystal. This, however, was not abundant, as was the siderite and calcite, uh, and heroin calcite. Uh, we did not find any oxygen in pyrite. We found just a little bit of pyrite in, uh, in a grain, but it definitely was not oxygenic. However, at the, at the Galloway site, we did not find any of the spiderite forming, but we found a lot of FES precipitate, and this happens to be on a nilmanite grain. We also found on the quartz grains. This was very abundant. So the sulfide and nitrogen precipitating up very rapidly here uh, on, on these mineral grains. So I think this, this demonstrates that uh, from the geochemistry here, we have been able to verify some of the things that we've seen on the sediment by what you would, you would predict based on the geochemistry. Finally, in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that I think that we have gained a lot of information by looking at the evolution of, the, of these plumes with time, especially the one of Omiji, and this helps us to understand the geochemistry of these environments. And finally, that we showed that we have attenuation of hydrocarbons based on their anoxic and oxic conditions, and the rates based on our field studies appear to be about the same. And finally, that um, we have seen the formation of some orthogenic minerals under conditions where you usually don't expect to find uh, minerals being formed, usually in shallow systems, minerals are dissolving. But when you have a big source of organic carbon, and then the system changes and you can actually get precipitation of minerals in shallow environments. And finally, I hope that some of the things that we have, uh, have done at this site will help in remediation efforts and helping managers make uh, better decisions about remediation. Thank you very much.